Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of The Operations Room, a podcast for COOs. I am Brandon Mensinger, and as always, joined by my lovely co-host, Bethany Ayers. How are things going, Bethany? They're going okay, like in the spirit of our embodiment chat that we're about to have and like how to get in touch with our bodies and to acknowledge that we have them. I'm not feeling great today. I'm relieved to say it's not COVID. So after six weeks free of COVID, but now it's some sort of tummy bug virus, like low level, my stomach hurts, but you know, I'm here. Okay. So the <laughs> December bugs are floating around. Yeah. Because why not? Why, why not just catch something new and unpleasant? Pre this bug, probably where I caught the bug was I went to EQT's People and Talent Christmas event on Wednesday. It was awesome because it was the first tech event I have ever been to where there were more women in the room. Wow. Okay. That's impressive. It was nice, but in some ways almost off putting because I'm like, what are all these women doing here? Where have they all been? (laughs) (laughs) So abnormal. It's so unusual. So completely unusual. And then the men who were there were like quite nice and open and a little bit metro. And like, it was just a totally different vibe than, let's say, the pavilion Christmas drinks that I have been to in the past, where it's all like bravado and extrovert and... I'm the most amazing person in the room. You know? <laughs> well, uh, perhaps EQT was doing some uh, curation of their lists. They're trying to like figure out who's the right mix for our particular brand or mission. I think it was just because it was people and talent, and people and talent are where all the women hang out. Good point. Could be as easy as that. <laughs> <laughs> it was a fascinating conversation. I felt like the imposter in the room because everybody was people and talent, and then they'd be like, "And what do you do?" <laughs> I'm a CEO. I, I'm neither people nor, nor talent. talent. I definitely have a new found appreciation for people and talent having done the COO role. So rather than like when I was CRO, I was like, I have a really big team. I know how I want to lead my team. I know how I want to structure things. What do you do? And then moving over to a COO role, I'm like, oh, you work on putting in all of the structures, you make sure that all of the managers are talking the same way. You put in proper performance management, performance management matters for fairness. Like my past perception of HR before being on the other side was risk management. Was there any takeaways from the EQT event or any kind of interactions you had that are noteworthy? What was really interesting was A lot of the event was talking about how to have the people team become more strategic or embrace the fact that they are strategic. So looking at metrics, looking at business cases, how to argue the efficiency and operations implications of not involving the people team and the people team being able to have the right language to push back. So we broke up into workshops and our case study workshop thing was, you have just been told we need to expand into three markets. Now what? And a lot of it was, how did this happen? Where HR or the people team wasn't in the room when this decision was made? What are the implications that you need to talk about? And it not just being like the low level tactical, but how do you raise that conversation up so that everybody else in the room takes the people team seriously? The people leader needs to be at the leadership table for sure for these kinds of conversations, because ultimately, whatever you end up doing for rolling things out in new markets or whatever, there is a massive people implication in all sorts of respects, whether it's the actual human beings that are being deployed or the countries that they're going into in this example, but the people person being upfront, thinking through with the leadership team, the implications of whatever choices they're making is incredibly useful. And by not having the person there, it's like, A, you're kind of like putting them in a position where you know, they're being pushed stuff to respond to, which is not a great position to be in from a kind of an empowerment perspective, but equally you're losing the visibility of like a really important voice in the room. Absolutely. So it was interesting to first see the coaching of the team on how to respond, but then also I think there was a more of a confidence level. Like everybody in the room was capable of being able to have the strategic conversations, but some had the confidence and others were talking about I know I'm right, but 
how do I do that? And how do I back myself? So hats off to EQT Ventures for having a phenomenal get together for people and talent in this case. I've been recently exposed to this kind of vertical where the people person generally is not the budget holder, that the budget actually, in fact, that the people person is using is part of the the CFO's budget, essentially. And at first, it was quite shocking to me. I was like, what? The people person doesn't have an actual budget themselves that they can draw upon? I'm just wondering if you have a thought on this. It's common in a way because of maybe the heritage of people teams coming from HR, where it's been very people-based, a little bit of legal you know, with risk mitigation, but not numeric in any way. And the rise of people ops, people analytics, people data means that you now really need to have those systems in place. And those systems are critical to operating the business and ensuring fairness. So people leaders should have control over their IT budgets and also should be thinking about people ops, hiring in people ops, understanding if they maybe are not the most intuitively numeric people that they should bring in somebody who is and can help them run the business through a combination of, from Myers-Briggs, the F, I suspect most people teams or people leaders index very highly on F, which by the way, for anybody who doesn't know Myers-Briggs is the feeling, like interacting through feeling and bring somebody in who counterbalances you with a highly indexed T, the thinking, logical, and you combine those two together and it makes magic and is very powerful for the business. I love it. Thinking and feeling together as one. I was like, yes, that is the two things that you need in this case. So with that, why don't we move on to our conversation with Davinia, Maddie, and Pippa. I am delighted to welcome us to part two of our Embodied Leadership podcast. Today, we have Davinia, who is one of our old favorites. I don't know. Davinia's first episode is by far our most listened to. So I suspect everybody who's listening today has listened to hers with What is a COO? And then we are also joined by Maddie Fox, who has also been a previous guest and is a expert in embodied leadership. And finally, Pippa Richardson. I've worked with Pippa for many years. She is deeply embodied and has been part of my embodiment journey. For those of you who joined our first episode, it was very much the theory around embodied leadership, what it means, why it might be interesting for you. And what we're looking to do with the second episode is move past the theory and into the how share our examples of embodiment, our journeys into it. And then also hopefully we'll have a bit of time to do some, offer up some practices so that anybody who is curious might find a path to their embodiment or start on their journey. What I was going to do after introducing all of our guests is maybe controversially starting with Brandon because Brandon and I have had some conversations around embodiment. And Brandon, I'd love to hear your story, or if you could share your story with the group. So I think first off, the word embodiment is very abstract, and it's confusing to me. And, you know, Bethany, every time we talk about it, I re-understand it with you, and I get it. But there's something just weirdly abstract about the concept that I just find challenging to wrap my mind around So just from a journey perspective, I would say that a long time ago, I realized that I had a communication problem and it had stalled my career fundamentally. I had a lot of challenges communicating with the people that I line managed and I had challenges communicating with senior stakeholders in the business. And what was apparent to me back in the early 2000s is that traditional communications training was terrible. You would sit in a chair, they would tell you how to communicate, they would give you the theory around communications, best practice, this, that, and the other, but you didn't actually communicate yourself. So it was a bit of a joke. And the question I was asking myself at that point is, what do I do now? And I remember reading a magazine and saw an advertisement for an acting class. And I said, you know what? That sounds interesting. That sounds exciting. Let me try that. And within a very short time frame, I had a couple of revelations, one of which is this. Acting is really the embodiment of the character to make it come alive and pop for the audience. 
And really, it's an examination of the human condition and an exploration of the human condition through yourself with the characters that you play. And a lot of the foundational work you do is to get out of your head, get into your body, and connect with your impulses. And really, just to be extraordinarily present with the other actors on stage to be in a position to give and receive, to really make the play spectacular in terms of real emotional gravitas. And the evidence of this is usually very clear when you watch theater production shows, because if the actors are connected with themselves and with the other actors, they have an ability to take you on an emotional journey, a journey that you feel. So if you leave a theater production feeling emotionally moved or that emotionally you've gone from point A to point B, the actors have done a fabulous job. And if you feel no emotion and you feel like you haven't been moved, then what's happened is that the actors have not done their jobs and you know they're essentially reading lines to each other, which is very uninspiring and uninteresting. So the next time you go to a theater show, I would suggest check in with yourself. Did you get an emotional feeling from the show itself by the time you left? And if you did, great. And if you didn't, then what you saw was people reading lines in this case. And the question that was asked and answered for me in these acting classes is, how do you do this? And I specialized in something called the Meisner Technique. And the Meisner Technique has a foundational tool called the repetition exercise. And the repetition exercise is you sitting in a chair two feet away from the other actor, you lock eyes, and you make observations about the other person and repeat it back and forth. So for example, Bethany, I would say you're wearing a blue shirt. And then you would say, I'm wearing a blue shirt. And then I would say, you're wearing a blue shirt. I'm wearing a blue shirt. You go back and forth. It sounds ridiculous. It sounds monotonous and it sounds boring. But when you actually do it and you do it well, it is absolutely mesmerizing because what happens is it is not about the words. It is about you being open to receiving the other person's body language and the emotion that has bubbled up within that other person surfaced and delivered to you and you receiving that, feeling that, and then you servicing whatever comes naturally to you and giving it back to the other person. And when this works well, it's spectacular. You really feel there's an emotion to it that is undeniable. And I think the outcome for me ultimately was that Meisner is by far the most emotionally difficult thing I've ever done in my life, hands down. Uh, just very challenging, challenging work. And it makes you confront yourself in ways that can be very uncomfortable, but the outcome can be spectacular, which is I have an ability when I need to, to be able to connect to myself, connect to others, and to really create that emotional resonance and body language uh, when I need it in a very organic and natural, authentic way. And you can't ask for anything more than that. It's not that I can do this all the time, but I can put myself there when I need to, whether it's with an individual, a team, or with the wider company in this case. And that was my journey. So I just thought it was interesting because like often, Brandon, you're like, I just think this is what I experienced with acting. And I had such a, oh, that's amazing moment because so often we believe that the way that we have discovered something new or a truth is the only way of accessing it but that's just not true. There's an infinite number of ways. And so what I thought would be really interesting is for everybody to share how they discovered they had a body, which I know sounds so silly, but like I think it's basically what we're talking about. And hopefully that inspires other people to either realize, oh yeah, I am embodied already, or that sounds really fascinating. I want to go and act, or I want to go to a Pilates class, or I want to do some yoga, or Divinia. I don't know what your journey is. So super curious, like how did you discover you had a body? Along the way, when I was doing systemic team coaching, I bumped into a chap called Nick Kitchen, and he's an executive coach, but he loves somatic practice. And I was doing team coaching supervision with him. And basically, he would therefore make it all about <laughs> somatic practice with our team coaching clients and we'd bring them into the room and then we'd talk about them. And it became really fascinating to me about how little sometimes what people were saying and what was happening for them with their body and in their body did not match up. So that's kind of my entry into it. And I spent a year in team supervision with him and a group of other people and it was just fascinating having all of these different folks bring their team experiences into this room where we then deconstructed them and talked about it. And then thought back to 
my sort of time as a leader in business, I feel like I was a very, very cognitive leader most of the time, to be honest, and didn't really pay attention to my feelings. And whilst I've been studying organisational TA, we talk a lot about how organisations probably dumb this down as in they you're sort of almost not allowed to have feelings or you'll seem to be, especially as a woman, you'll seem to be too emotional and all this other stuff. And because you've introduced the term somatic, I think I'll introduce Pippa next because Pippa is a somatic practitioner and I doubt very many people understand the word somatic. So Pippa, could you both talk about your journey, but also help us understand what somatic means? I think my journey has been a significant one. (laughs) And I would say that it was led by necessity rather than choice. In my very, very early career days in a corporate setting, I started to really struggle with my own mental health, which was kind of compounded of years of not being able to attune or regulate my body. And literally the word somatic as a term, soma, the first part of the word is the Greek word for body. (laughs) So it's body-based practices. And I had tried talking therapy and the practice of talking therapy just hadn't been able to engage me. I had originally thought that that was potentially my age and being quite young and not finding it very interesting or fun (laughs) to be sat in a room with somebody still who wanted to talk to me. But much later, I was able to actually understand that a component was being deeply missed in that process, which was my body process and the kind of dysregulation that I was experiencing at the time. But a core component was that I worked weekly, one-to-one with a body psychotherapist for five years, which had a profound impact on my life. It changed my life. It probably saved my life. And I think your question, Beth, when did you first realize that you had a body? It was in the connecting to my body that I realized I had been highly dissociated from my body. And I hear lots of people talk in a number of different settings from organizations to clinical settings that talk about or recognize a disconnect or a sethering or even a sense of being divorced from self-body feelings. So somatic practice and inquiry is really an opportunity to put the body at the foreground of the experience. And when I think about what is somatic therapy, why would we engage in it? It's the recognition that alongside our words, the body is also communicating. So a somatic therapist is trained to foreground the nonverbal and is trained to foreground and direct somebody's awareness to their embodied experience, which for me was incredibly helpful and was my way in. And Maddie? Yeah, so a little similar to Pippa, there was two things really that got me into this space. One was I also had talking therapy, which was really helpful in acknowledging what were perhaps my issues, but I kind of didn't know what to do with it after that. It's like, why is this so what? So I think that was one kind of place where I started to get really curious. And the second was after training as a Pilates instructor, I had this curiosity around body and mind together. And this is back before we even really were talking about body, mind, or mindfulness wasn't even really a thing in organizations. And it really was, both those things were a curiosity and I didn't really know what to do with them. When I did my coaching training, the facilitator of the course, having expressed this curiosity, the facilitator of the course shared with me, oh, have you come across Richard Strozzi Heckler's work? He is set up the Strozzi Institute and they do a somatic coaching program. So I, which I was like, oh, this all sounds wonderful. She'd expressed the Greek word for soma being body or the body in its living wholeness. And I went, yes, that's definitely my thing. And I wandered around thinking that for a while until I read the book and went, oh, I'm not really sure I understand this and really needed to have that actual experience of it, right? It's a very experiential thing. And I think as Pip has talked about in terms of that severing of head and body, we live in a very cognitive world. We live in a very head first world. And sometimes people refer to 
the body not just being a brain taxi, right? It's not just there to sort of carry us around. And I think it's important to note that whilst Pilates got me my curiosity around that, it's very possible to do exercise and not be in an embodied way, right? And not be connected with your body. There's a sort of functionality to it often, which is about an objectified version of body, right? The sort of looking outside. And as Pippa started to talk about, we're not talking about that objectified version. We're talking about that feeling sense inside the body and what that kind of brings to us and actually getting connected to sensations, you know, whether that's kind of temperature, feelings, movement, or again, Pippa mentioned about sort of being disconnected from that, you know, where do we have numbness or where do we not have feeling? Because actually that's all data in its data in itself. So it's really thinking about that inside out experience and not how we look at the body externally. I 100% agree with you on exercise is not the same as embodiment. And maybe I will share my journey because it is very much that. Like you, I did five years of therapy, talking therapy, and I did find it helpful. And those five years were me becoming a person rather than a shell of a person who was so riddled by shame that I didn't feel like I belonged with anybody in any group. I always felt like I was the outsider and deservedly so. And so it took those five years. And it was actually probably my first hint and sensation of body, but I didn't realize it until I'm talking to you today, (laughs) that I felt very empty. And I didn't like physically empty, like there was nothing in my core. And so I had lots of protective outer layers because there was nothing inside. There was no strength there. And through the five years, I remember saying at the end when we were finishing therapy that I felt like I was solid. I felt like I had a core. And that for me was just talking and learning that I'm not disgustingly horrible person. (laughs) And then I carried on with life. I thought I was fixed. I mean, I was fixed. And then I left New Voice Media. My mother was very ill. I had a lot of free time and I decided to go to this yoga studio that was a five minute walk from my house. And I ended up doing yoga every single day for about a year and a half as a way of keeping sane. And in that process, there was a class on a Wednesday evening and it was unlike any other thing I'd ever experienced. And I was doing a lot of yoga and I was just like, what are we doing here? It's Hatha yoga. Hatha yoga has changed. I didn't realize this is what yoga was now. This is amazing. I want more of this. And it was Pippa's class. And so eventually I got to a point where I couldn't go to any of the other classes because they were telling me what to do. My feet were wrong. My arms were wrong. It felt weird. Whenever I did it the right way, they'd be like, yes, your arms are right. And I was like, all of this feels wrong. And when I would adjust it to what I'd learned in Pippa's class, they'd be like, no, your arms are too close. Your arms are too far. Your feet aren't right. And so I got to the point where I was like, well, you know what? I'm not doing this anymore. (laughs) And I actually then started working one-on-one with Pippa, but I spent about, I don't know, a year undoing everything that I had learned at yoga and discovering that I had control over my body. And what felt right for my body was right for my body, even if it didn't look Instagram right or my hips weren't the way that the yoga teacher had taught me I needed to look. And so actually, I think yoga, I happen to have discovered Pippa and discovered joy in life, but yoga in and of itself. So therapy gave me the ability to be a person in the world and embodiment has given me unlimited joy. And I would just love that everybody can feel as joyful and free as I do, which is why we gathered up this group in the first place, (laughs) because I just love that everybody can feel inspired, not feel pressured, and realize that there's so many ways that you can start to feel less shame around your body, less hatred, less resentment, and realize that you have control over all of you, and it's down to you to give yourself what you want. There's a really interesting point you're making, Beth, around the joy too, because what I often talk about with clients is that 
in the numbing of sensation or the disconnect to the embodied experience. We're often doing that because living in a body is a really hard place to call home. And in the southering of connection, we are also limiting the connection or the possibility for connection, joy, pleasure. In other words, we can't not have the uncomfortable or difficult feelings and only have the good. There is a an impact that spans the entirety of the human experience if we are in disconnect to the body. And I guess it's also important to say that if we are experiencing disconnect, it will be for very valid reason. Systemically, it's also reinforced by our culture, society. I often say if everyone was getting behind their embodied needs and intuition, we'd have most adults not showing up to work, adults having tantrums in the supermarket. (laughs) It would kind of grind our society and workforce to a halt. So it's reinforced, in other words. And I think holding the systemic piece is really important when we think about the individual experiences as to why it might be difficult for us to connect to the body. And I think on that, Pippa, is about being kind to ourselves for that, right? The body's an incredible thing and it made adaptations at a time in your life when you needed it to in order that you would get your needs met. Right. If we're all primed for safety, belonging and dignity, then when those things come into question, we may have to adapt ourselves in order to get those. And that's really clever. So the fact that it has severed from something or there is a lack of feeling, that was done as a protective piece for us. And so I think that's also why there's a level of caution going into this too, right? Because starting to feel again may bring up things for you that are big feelings, right? And they're big feelings to kind of contend with and why it's therefore useful to sort of do that in a in a guided way and with someone to support it. But yeah, I think it's really important to recognize that we are inherently incredible beings who are able to adapt ourselves in order to kind of survive And that it just may be that today that's not serving us in the same way, right? That's something we've been holding on to for a long time. And now that might well be holding us back, you know, as Brandon talked about in his getting to the acting place, realizing that, you know, the communication was becoming a bit more challenging. Um, And so that's a great kind of place to start exploring where that sort of behavior may not be serving us anymore. Well, and it's interesting, isn't it? Because I think the body as well is a phenomenal store. I quite often hear from clients that when you leave this unattended for really long periods of time, you may start to see things in your body that are trying to tell you that something is really not good anymore and can be quite debilitating. So your body is trying to warn you or or trying to trigger you into doing something about it that might be locked in there or suppressed. I think I understand what you mean, but maybe just to clarify it, it can be things like physical pain, but can also be anxiety. So kind of like just feeling a racing heart or feeling very uncomfortable in your body. Like, are there other examples that you can share of what you mean? So, I mean, in terms of unregulated stress, all sorts of things, right, which could be phenomenological, (laughs) as it were, so temperature or physical conditions like racing heart or what have you, or behaviours that are a result of this which are things like procrastination or a lack of empathy or other things that you may notice but your body contains that data and trying to unlock some of that your body may get to a point where it needs you to before your brain is sort of caught up if you know we've used the term dysregulation and regulation a couple times Pippa that's something that you'd introduced to me could you explain it a bit more what you mean and what the sensations are really what I'm referencing is the autonomic nervous system. There might be some knowledge that some of our listeners will hold around an understanding of that. We can think about the two branches of the nervous system, so the sympathetic nervous system and the parasympathetic nervous system. I like to think of the sympathetic nervous system as our accelerator and the parasympathetic nervous system as the brake. So during the day, we will be moving between 
these two states and they're broad states and ideally there would be a flexibility in our system to move between these states quite fluidly, quite easily. So if we were running late to work and a child had been sick in the back of the car and we'd maybe had a morning that was not ideal, I imagine that many of us would start to experience some signals of stress. In fact, even before we started recording, we were acknowledging, myself included, that some of us were feeling a bit nervous around the anticipation of the podcast and I could feel my hands getting clammy. I could feel I was a little bit restless. So my body was giving me the signals of anticipation, some anxiety, possibly excitement. They can be closely related. And Ideally, if then, for example, if we stay with the work scenario, once we'd kind of got to work, had a cup of tea, sat down, ideally our system would regulate and settle down. So the brake system would come on. So as I said, ideally we'd be moving through that throughout the day without too much difficulty. A dysregulated state can happen under repeated stress or in the presence of trauma where the experience of our state starts to shift into wider states outside of this more familiar day-to-day accelerate and pause. So some of our listeners will be familiar with fight, flight, freeze states. So we're kind of moving into a bit more kind of technical kind of language, if you like. But a dysregulated state will be when we move outside of this window of tolerance and essentially we get caught in a stress cycle where it then becomes much more difficult to regulate. So if we had a difficult conversation with someone at work and we're noticing that actually that's impacting us all day or maybe even all week, it's probably giving us a signal that our system is overloaded Um, we use a term in kind of trauma therapy, which is actually flooding. So when has our system become so flooded? And for some people that might be expressed in high anxiety or panic. For somebody else that might be expressed in shutdown, withdrawn, more of a kind of depressive collapse state. They're both expressions of dysregulation. And I think talking about going with your theme, Pippa, about thinking about the day, and how we might move between those states. One of the things as we talked about, you know, we said we were going to think a little bit about the how today. And I think one of the things that can really impact us is let's say we go through back to back meetings. I'm pretty certain most people listening to this podcast will be familiar with what that's like. And so we don't have any gaps through that. We hang up the phone and possibly one's late and then we're late for the next one. And what we then tend to take through with us is that first meeting of the day is probably in shards still with us by the last meeting of the day. And so that starts to then impact how present we can be with the next meeting because perhaps we're still thinking about something that was perhaps unresolved or was difficult in that meeting before or gosh, there's loads of work I need to do as a result of that. But now I'm in, you know, meeting number three, meeting number four. So one of the ways that we can help ourselves, I think, to do that is actually to have intentional pauses between those meetings that allow us to complete the meeting we've been in and get ourselves present and there are techniques to do that. I mean, some of that may just be giving yourself 10 minutes to make a couple of notes, take a breath, move on to the next one. It might be walking outside at some point. It might be actually sitting down and having your lunch, even if that's for 20 minutes rather than doing that on the run. By putting in some intentional pauses and some intentional spaces that we can start to allow our system to let go or finish the thing that we were in and enable us to move into the next thing with a little bit more presence and intentionality. So I think this is a very present problem with a lot of senior executives because you have long days, there's a lot of stuff to get done in scale-up companies, you're under tremendous pressure, 
And one part of it is, you know, carrying baggage from previous meetings or interactions you've had with others. The other part of it very clearly is just purely energy levels, because as it tails into the last part of the day, you've had four cups of coffee, you're crashing basically. So everything kind of compounds, uh, both in terms of irritability, but also energy levels as well, I suppose. And, you know, I think a lot of your suggestions make tremendous sense. And being present in the next meeting is just, if you want to get value out of the meeting, you need to be present to give what you can to that person to make them successful, obviously. Is there anything else that you could think about suggestion-wise here? I think that point about volume and there's this sort of sense of the speed with which needs to happen with everything is really challenging in the workplace. I actually heard something from someone last week. I think it's an army term or it's a military term of slow is smooth, smooth is fast. And I've been holding that because I just think that's really interesting. There's a sense that if we pause throughout our day, that actually we will get less done right? Because there's only so many hours in the day. But I think to your point about energy, those are some of the things that can help you to maintain energy rather than sort of, you know, fluctuating in two bigger ways. And so I think there's those pauses that we've talked about during the day, but, and I'm sure Pippa and Davinia, you've got some as well. I think there are also practices that we can be doing outside of our day in order to actually give us a little bit more resilience help us to be more present. We've already mentioned some of those. So whether it's yoga or some sort of form of exercise, being outside, those are the kinds of things that can give us some level of resilience. There's a lovely exercise that I do in some of my resilience coaching work where you reflect on the things that give you energy and drain your energy. And they're sort of put into different camps, things you must do. And I like the way that it acknowledges that in your day-to-day work, there are things you're going to have to do. Some of them are going to be very draining, but you start to sort of categorize these things to ensure that you've got enough of the energy givers that then give you back enough energy to carry in your day. And also to reassess your criteria for these things. And I often use the example of a coaching client of mine who was a runner. And during the periods of time when he didn't run, he thought less well. He had a whole range of things going on that didn't really serve him, but running really helped him to kind of overcome those. For him, running was a must-do energy giver versus an optional energy giver, for example, because he found it had such an impact on him as a human being all the time and his behaviour and the way he related to others that he had to incorporate it into his own practice. Whereas I think a lot of the time we think these are optional. I could just go and do this or I might just go. We're actually building a practice becomes more about the things that you know will help you. And they're all different for every person. So it's quite a nice exercise to really go through things. And also in your working day, you can then start to decide, okay, so there are things I must do here, but there are optional things here that are draining me too. So how do I start to mitigate some of those? And how can I rearrange my work in a more sort of forgiving way for me so I'm more effective, productive, but also have more energy too? It comes down to the giving yourself permission to do the things you want to do. And for me, experiencing it in my body has given me permission in my life. You know, I'm like... I can move my toes however I want. Ha ha. And then suddenly I can also decide whether or not I, I don't know, still work. My husband is a real runner. So depending on what you said about running, like, yeah, he doesn't have a choice, but it doesn't have to be for those of us who are not runners, like, oh, the equivalent has to be an hour out or whatever. One of my non-negotiables is at the end of the day, I lay flat on the ground for a couple minutes. And that just really helps me. It like undoes all the time in the chair. It settles me back down. Sometimes I then decide I want to move more. And sometimes it's just laying on the ground. And sometimes it's laying on the ground for 10 seconds. And sometimes it's laying on the ground for an hour. Like there's just tapping into what I need, but it's super easy. It's not going out for a run, (laughs) which I just, is not me. (laughs) One of the other things that comes to mind, I guess, Brendan, when you were talking is I think we need to hold the flexibility of being able to do an activity like running or Beth, your own kind of somatic practice that you're giving us as an example, which is great if we have the time and we can prioritize the time. And I'm also holding, I guess, an example of something which I encourage clients to develop, which is what can we do kind of literally in the here and now in terms of what can we do in a meeting. So even in the context of this podcast, we're here, we're talking, it's engaging. 
it would be really easy for my attention to be completely outside of myself. And as a practice or a somatic practice of attunement, what I really encourage people to develop is how do I maintain some contact with my internal state? So even as I'm sat here, I can be aware of how I feel in the chair. I can notice that I'm leaning a bit more to the left than to the right. Can I get more comfortable? So there's a developing over time of an attunement to self always, as opposed to I'll do my run on a Thursday at four and that's the time that I check in with myself. And that can be helpful in addition. But I guess I'm thinking, Davinia, you said that there's a number of things that actually are so tiny and simple and have a profound impact to change our state this dual awareness that I'm talking about, can I be in contact with myself whilst being in contact with another? We can practice that whilst driving. We can practice that in a meeting, a difficult conversation. It can be with us always. That actually came out of uh, trauma therapy work where they noticed that if we maintain dual awareness, contact with myself as well as others, then we limit the impact of stress of the engagement that we're in so there's actually the science to show a practice like that can reduce our stress levels very very simple it does take practice though um, I really love that do you know the other thing that it brings up in my thoughts is around can I sort of do a resilience coaching group work it's a two-hour session and right in the middle of the session there's a grounding exercise which is so you sit or stand try to come back into your body you do five, notice five things in your immediate environment, and then it goes five, four, three, two, one, the things that you can hear, taste, smell, etc. And it's fascinating that it's halfway through this session, and you'd think that everyone was present by then, right? You, you would have thought that, because we've already been talking about stuff for an hour, and, and we've done a check-in, we may have done two, and halfway through this exercise, and every time you get people that are then like, that's really weird, I've just sort of come back into my body. Because there's this feeling of sort of really honing back into yourself because you're doing things that relate to what you can taste, what you can hear. So it's all of your senses. But this is, I think the challenge that we have is that when we use words like being present, et cetera, et cetera, it's actually a lot harder to do than you would expect. And so I love this idea of developing a connection to your inner self that you can tap into more readily, because otherwise I think that you can feel that you're present, but you may not actually be as present as you as would be good for you or make you feel it, you know, in a very positive way. We have something similar in um, somatic coaching, Davinia, which is a centering practice, which we do to be present, open, connected and on purpose. And we talk about intentional practice with it. So 200 repetitions or 300 repetitions for muscle memory, 3000 to embody a change. And the point is to practice when you're okay, right? In order that when you're under pressure, you can actually access all of that good practice and you can be a little bit more at choice about, about how you respond in that moment. And that can be five minutes, it can be 15 minutes. And it's about how you bring it into your day. So Pippi, you talked about doing it in a meeting you know, connecting while you're driving the car or, you know, we say if you're while you're waiting for the kettle to boil or you're standing on the tube or you're waiting for a bus, these are great opportunities to do that sort of micro practice around it. So we had hoped to fit in maybe one example and not do so much chatting about it. I'm happy to do a speedy centering practice, if you like, and sort of show a state changer. Okay, which everyone who is listening can do along with us. Okay, I'm just going to ask you to think about something, a really difficult interaction. If you're thinking about one to 10, let's go for a five or six out of 10 that you've had recently. And I want you to just bring that to mind and bring those physical sensations that come with it. So maybe your hands clench, maybe you'll focus what happens on your breath, maybe your shoulders are hunched. I can see some nods, so let that go. I didn't mean to make you fully relive that, but so you've got that feeling inside of you. Okay, so uh, shaking that off, 
we're going to do this. We're all sitting. So finding your feet on the ground, feeling the back of the chair, holding your weight, doing a quick scan up the body to let go of any tension and draw some attention to familiar places, which might be the knees, the buttocks, the tummy, shoulders, letting go of the jaw, relaxing behind the eyes. So that's how we find ground. And then if we add centering to that, think the center, you can take your hand to your sort of belly button or your stomach center is two inches below the belly button in the center of our body, sometimes known in other domains as the Dantian or the Hara. And from that place, I want you to lengthen up as you also lengthen down. So this isn't coming into tightening the body. This is about maybe finding some space in the vertebrae and just growing a little taller out of the crown of the head. And then from that center, pushing out to the sides of the body. So breathing into the sides of the body and seeing if you can just extend out a little further. Maybe you can feel the clothes on the side of your body. And then from center, focusing on your depth. So back of the body. And the back of the body represents all of that knowledge, experience, history that you have. Feeling into the back of the body, extending out a little further. And then coming to the front of the body. Our future, our unknown. And again, seeing if you can extend a little further to that. And now recalling that thing that I asked you to think about before we started this, where is that now in relation to you? How do you feel about that? Um, maybe someone can share for the listeners. My experience was creating a bit more space and, and I think central to what you're bringing, Maddie, I guess feeds back to the question, why would we do this? And I think central to that is having more choice. And when we're in a dysregulated state, physiologically, we will not have the same availability of choice to our actions, our feelings, our thoughts. So it feels really key as an example as to why we might engage or prioritize a practice because we have more space, distance, and the outcome of that is then that we have more choice. And that's got to be a win <laughs> as far as I'm concerned, moving from reaction to conscious choice. And I think this is a perfect place to end because Pippa, when you said that, that reminded me that's what's a lot of the theme of episode one and you unwittingly brought it back and it's a perfect conclusion so thank you thank you pippa maddie and divinia for joining us on the operations room if you like what you hear please subscribe or leave us a comment and we'll see you next week 